We are going to begin tonight's program with some welcoming remarks by Brother Zafar Bangish, the director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable uh, Consul General Yasser Bhatt Saab, uh, First Secretary Dr. Najam Ussahar, brothers and sisters and guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> As you know, uh, today uh, we are gathered here to commemorate uh, Kashmir Black Day, which is basically observed on October 27th. And this day dates back to 1947 when Indian troops illegally invaded and occupied the state of Jammu and Kashmir. When the Indian troops arrived there, they perpetrated a massacre in Jammu where, according to one report, uh, by Horace Alexander, a British journalist writing in The Spectator, he said something like 200,000 Kashmiris were slaughtered. And another estimate by Ian Stephen, a British author, said something like half a million people were killed. And another 350,000 Kashmiris were driven out of Jammu. So almost overnight, in Jammu district, which had 62% Muslim population, was turned into a Muslim minority because almost a million people were either killed or driven out. And so Jammu's population was reduced to about 31% of Muslims. Of course, the Kashmir Valley, which comprises about 97% Muslims, they couldn't carry out a massacre, but there also a horrific uh, tyranny and oppression has been unleashed since that time. In fact, we need to keep in mind that the struggle of the Kashmiri people dates back much further than that. I would say that it goes back all the way up to 1846, when the British, the, the, the devils that they are, uh, they sold the state of Jammu and Kashmir to Gulab Singh, who was a Dogra ruler. And the reason why they sold the state of Jammu and Kashmir to him was because Gulab Singh had betrayed the Sikhs that the British were involved in, in fighting over there. And not only did they sell the state of Jammu and Kashmir for 750,000 rupees, but there was something else that the British did. And, they, and that was that they gave Gulab Singh absolute sovereignty over the people of Kashmir. So in other words, the people were basically completely divested of their fundamental rights. That was as far back as 1846. And if you look at Kashmir's history, there was an uprising in 1927 when the Kashmiris rose up against um, outsiders from coming and settling into Kashmir. There was another uprising in 1931. Incidentally, the 1927 uprising gave, to, gave rise to that Article 35A that was in the Indian Constitution that was abrogated on August the 5th, uh, 2019, that has now opened the floodgates of uh, non-Kashmiris to come and settle in Kashmir whereby the population of Kashmir, of course, is going to be diluted. According to estimates, something like three and a half to four million non-Kashmiris have been settled in Kashmir since 2019. And they're not just settled uh, in a sense that they can uh, come and live with the, within the Kashmiri community. What they are doing is they are creating separate uh, communes for them on the same basis as you have these settlements in occupied Palestine. Yes. So basically, what you see is that the Indians are now implementing the same policy that the Zionists are uh, instituting in uh, occupied Palestine. 
And in fact, uh, the Indian Consul General, uh, Sandeep Chakarwarti, uh, in October of 2018, while speaking in New York, he was uh, the Consul General in New York, he actually said that we are not only going to get the Kashmiri Pandits, there are of course Kashmiri Pandits who have left Kashmir, we're not only going to settle them, but we are going to follow the same policy. We have a role model, we have a road map, and that is exactly the road map that the Israelis are pursuing in occupied Palestine. So there are very striking parallels between what's happening in uh, occupied Palestine and what's happening in occupied Kashmir. <clears throat> I want to now talk about exactly um, what is it that we, uh, and we are of course um, Canadian citizens, what is it that, that we can do? Obviously, uh, there are uh, certain steps that we can take and I think we should take them for the sake of our Kashmiri brothers and sisters. But before I uh, move forward, I want to give you a bit of good news and that is that last Monday, <clears throat> um, there was a launch of a new initiative and that is that um, it's called Kashmir Palestine Scholars Solidarity Network. And last Monday there was a webinar. I participated in that and I was very pleased with the initiative because I wasn't involved in initiating it, but the initiative was very good. Um, there were some, there were very good presentations that were made. And uh, there is a, uh, a scholar at Warwick University in England. Her name is uh, Dr. Goldie Usuri. She presented a beautiful paper on the history of Kashmir. And of course, there were Palestinian scholars also uh, that uh, presented uh, their opinions with respect to this initiative. And they pointed out that because there are so many similarities between what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in Kashmir, that it is imperative that Kashmiris and Palestinians, uh, scholars in particular, should get together and that they should work together in order to advance the cause of Kashmir. Uh, a couple of other things that I want to share with you, and you will inshallah see it in, in the uh, presentation by uh, Robert Fantina. He's a American-Canadian author. He's the author of several books. And uh, he's uh, about to uh, complete a book on colonial settlerism, uh, settlers, the, the parallels between what is happening in Palestine and what is happening in Kashmir. And we hope, inshallah, that the book would be out um, in, in, uh, very shortly. And we intend to hold a program in order to launch that book because it is important, I believe it is very important that uh, the issue of Kashmir needs to be supported at the academic level because there needs to be support for that initiative in order to spread it in the, in the uh, broader community. The other initiative that I think is uh, very important and I'm glad to be a part of that and that is that uh, a young Canadian student, uh, Michaela Levis, um, three years ago I was able to convince her and she even went to Pakistan with her mother and myself, we went there in December of 2019. I convinced her to do a master's degree in Kashmir studies, particularly with respect to uh, the patterns of migration, because she had already done uh, her undergraduate study from uh, York University uh, on the Palestinian issue. So I said, why don't you do another one on Kashmir? She, was, she did that, she got her master's degree and then she applied for her PhD and that was accepted. In fact, her master's thesis was uh, so much valued that she got a scholarship at York University to do her PhD. So at least at the academic level, we are beginning to make some progress. That's, that's the good news. Now I'm going to share some bad news with you as well. Uh, it's important that we take a realistic assessment of what is happening. Over the last, I mean, I've been involved with the Kashmir uh, issue and trying to highlight it over the last um, uh, 30 years right here in Canada. And we have met 
the electorate representatives, we have talked to MPs, we have talked to all kinds of people. Initially, I used to um, uh, write letters to the editor, whether it was the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star. In the 90s, these letters used to be pub published, then they stopped publishing them altogether. <laughs> Uh, in fact, in the 90s, they even published one of my articles in the Toronto Star regarding Kashmir, but now they don't want to know anything about it. And we have also been trying to interact with uh, the elected representatives in Canada, including incidentally on uh, August 13th, 2019, uh, we had a meeting uh, with then Foreign Minister Christia Freeland, who was also a Deputy, for a Deputy Prime Minister, uh, there were about eight, ten of us that met her. And um, now she's the finance minister as well as uh, deputy prime minister. And there are probably chances that after Justin Trudeau, although he's a young man, he'll be around for a while. But after Justin Trudeau, perhaps Christia Freeland may become the prime minister or the leader of the Liberal Party and ultimately perhaps the prime minister of Canada. In that August 13, 2019 meeting, this was a week after India had unilaterally ab abrogated uh, Articles uh, uh, 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution, abolishing Kashmir's special status and removing the restriction on non-Kashmiris to settle in Kashmir. I asked her two specific questions in that meeting, and I'd gone with all the documents. Her parliamentary secretary was there, and I said, uh, Madam Freeland, once the Liberal Party is re-elected into office, uh, I want to ask you for two things. Number one, will you pledge to us that you would ho hold uh, hearings in the Parliament uh, Human Rights Committee on the human rights situation in Kashmir? And number two, will you speak out? Because this is part of Canadian policy. It is in your, uh, on your website the foreign affairs uh, website, that you recognize Kashmir as disputed territory whose future has to be settled according to UN Security Council resolutions. Do you give me a pledge that Canada would speak out in support of these resolutions, which is part of your stated policy? I'll have to tell you, regrettably, she would not commit to either. She was very wishy-washy. Of course, she uttered a number of platitudes that, you know, we, of course, support human rights, but human rights in a general sense. And then her parliamentary secretary, uh, Rob Oliphant, who I think uh, is from the constituency where Sajad Heather's office is, um, Rob Olif Oliphant actually called me. He said, I'd like to meet you. I said, sure. We went with a few other people to his office. We talked about the Kashmir issue. And I think he's one of the MPs who is probably most informed about the Kashmir issue because we've been dealing with him for the last 30 years. And incidentally, I'd like to, at this stage, um, pay tribute to the late Ayub Qureshi, who passed away last year. He was the pioneer of Friends of Kashmir. And he was the one who had uh, established these contacts with people like uh, Rob Oliphant, uh, some other MPs uh, that have now, you know, retired, etc. But he was actively involved. Anyway, so when we went to see Rob Oliphant at his office, again in relation to the Kashmir issue, he told me very frankly, he said, look, he said, Zafar, I've known you for 30 years. We have discussed this issue many times. But we as a government cannot criticize India openly. He was very blunt, very frank about it. He said, I'm telling you very frankly, because India is our ally and we are not going to criticize India publicly. This was just as blunt as that. And I said, but look, I'm very surprised that you say that because it is on your website, on the foreign affairs website, that you recognize Kashmir as a disputed territory. He said, no, because India is our ally. And you know, I said, but then what do you do? How can you, you know, raise these issues? He said, well, Whenever we meet Indian officials, we do it in private. So I said, then please explain to me, how is it that you criticize China publicly, but you are not, you, you wouldn't, China is a much bigger power, much more powerful, and you wouldn't dare to raise your voice against the atrocities that India is committed, committing. He said, well, it's because, you know, there is an overall policy, our allies, um, 
feel that you know China is our adversary, so we have to confront China. India is our ally, and we are not going to do anything about. We are not going to criticize India uh, publicly. So this now brings me to the point of the future of how this global situation is going to evolve, and we need to be prepared for that. If you have read the national security document of the United States that Biden uh, released on October the 12th, in that he clearly specifies that China is the major threat to the United States. This is very, very clear from the document. I've read the whole document. I've got it. Number two talks about Russia as a, the second level challenge to the United States. And then, of course, talks about Iran and North Korea, etc. But China is the fundamental target of US policy that the United States has already declared that that's their enemy number one. And obviously, this is going to have implications for Kashmir. And this is something that I think Pakistan, which has been an advocate of the Kashmiri cause for decades, right from the beginning, from 1947, will face certain challenges. And I think it is important that we begin to pay attention to this aspect, because this is going to affect how uh, the Kashmir uh, issue is going to be brought up. And finally, I'd like to say that you know, as Canadians, even if we are uh, unable to make any headway with our uh, elected representatives, I think we need to build up support from the grassroots level up. That means interacting with human rights activists in Canada. And alhamdulillah, we have had considerable you know, success in that. Because I personally believe that you know, if um, Canadians generally are informed of what is happening, then they will respond in a positive way. Not everybody, but I think the vast majority would. And this also then places a responsibility upon us as Muslims, that if we expect our fellow Canadians to support us on the issue of Kashmir or Palestine, then when they have certain issues that they raise, and I'm going to give you examples. For instance, these people are supportive of, for instance, Cuba's independence and they want to prevent the United States from exerting pressure or undermining Cuba or the government of Cuba. The same applies to uh, Venezuela, Nicaragua. Now these activists, human rights activists in Canada then expect us to stand up with them in solidarity in these, on these issues as well. We cannot expect them to support us and then we are absent when it comes to the other areas. And I can tell you, I've always been there. I've always participated in them in a, in a few weeks' time. On November 27th, there's going to be the Cuban um, uh, Solidarity Day because they're celebrating Fidel Castro's you know, revolutionary you know, policies. Uh, and they've invited me to come and speak as well. And I will go there. And I want to invite others as well to be, so that they know that you know, when they support us, we are also there for them. So it's something that we need to keep in mind. So please consider this. And once again, I'd like to thank you for coming here. Uh, I took a little extra. Uh, please forgive me for that. But I thought I'd lay out the, the basic sort of, you know, um, background to what is happening in Kashmir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.